Hello, DrupalCon. My name is Kara Snow. I am with the Technology Association of Oregon, and I am very pleased to be here today to introduce our next speaker, Lev K. Lev is the founder and CEO of CredSpark and is here to shift your thinking about how to powerfully engage your audience. Please welcome Lev. Thanks, Kara. I appreciate it. Um, and uh, I'm going to dive in right now. Um, I appreciate everyone's time today in uh, showing up and in letting me be part of DrupalCon. Um, I am Lev. I'm the founder and CEO of CredSpark. We're a New York-based company that helps organizations engage people in ways that create value for both the organization and the audience members. Um, and this is my first ever DrupalCon, so um, uh, let's get started. What I'm going to cover today is really five important topics, um, starting with the power of questions. Um, and then we're going to get a little bit into the personalization mindset before anything else. I'll talk a little bit about behavioral data versus declared data, um, some specific use cases for personalization. Um, and then we'll start to jump into your personalization opportunities. Uh, so if you're ready, let's do this. Who are you? What do you need? How can I help you? So I wish we could be in the same room. I could hear your answers. I could ask for a show of hands and perhaps we could start a conversation that would lead to a working relationship. But uh, this is a virtual event. And so it reflects the underlying reality that even when there's not a pandemic, most relationships these days begin at a distance with someone exploring your digital presence but there are ways that we can bridge that distance. I asked you those questions not to be polite, but rather because asking questions is fundamental to building relationships today. Everybody pays a lot of attention to capturing data, but data is so voluminous, it's no longer particularly special. What we really need are insights to drive our understanding of individuals and insights come from asking questions. Speaking of questions, I hope you'll ask me some. Please feel free to type them in the chat window and ideally preface your question with a big Q so we can scan down and see your questions and then I'll cover those at the end. Consider this list of challenges. Do any of them resonate? Are you seeking greater engagement or a new audience? Do you need better insights on your current audience? I'm betting most of you are with organizations that are seeking to increase revenue. These are all growth challenges, but growth is never easy to come by. I'll submit to you today that most growth challenges share the same root cause. Low growth starts with low audience engagement. Either people aren't visiting your digital presence or they're not sticking around very long or they're not doing very much. This low engagement in turn is because your audience doesn't see you as relevant or at least not as relevant as other things which need their attention. And a layer below that, if you're not seen as relevant, I'd argue that this is due to a lack of personalization of your digital presence. Meaning you haven't connected with a visitor as a person, as a unique individual human being with needs and goals. So personalization is really the new normal. These days it seems that everybody wants everything personalized. We expect Chipotle to personalize our burrito. We want Spotify to recommend music to us on a weekly basis that reflects what we'd like to listen to. And we expect Netflix to recommend shows that we'll like. People hire personal trainers, they get personalized tattoos, and in general, people want more and more personalized experiences. This personalization trend is not going to stop. The modern world more and more caters to our every whim and reflects our belief that each of us is unique and special in some way, which means that one size fits all content, one size fits all product or services, they get less acceptable with each passing year that the personalization trend continues. So question for you, how personal is your organization? 
Are you part of this massive inexorable shift to personalized digital experiences? Perhaps you may have some personalization initiatives underway. Perhaps you have or are exploring tool sets to help you personalize. My firm, CredSpark, has such a tool set. But when it comes to personalization, your tool set is less important than your mindset. The personalization mindset is very simple. It's about them, not about you. It's about the individual visiting you, what they're interested in, what they need, what they are trying to accomplish. It's not about what you want to say or what you want them to watch or read. Rather, personalization is about creating value for them. It sounds obvious, right? The trouble is, it's very easy and still very normal for organizations' digital presences to be what I call unintentionally impersonal. You don't scorn your audience. You know they're important. You know they're individuals. And yet, it's likely you're making some mistakes. So I want to walk you through some examples of being unintentionally impersonal. A classic mistake for content creators is to organize their content by format video, a white paper, a blog post, a research report, et cetera, et cetera. Just because there are different ways your content is produced and different means by which it is consumed, that doesn't mean that people care about the format of your content. If your organization has content which will make me smarter on a topic I really need to understand, I don't care if it's a video, a long form text article, an infographic, I just want everything you have that will make me smarter. So please don't make me search in different buckets based upon content format. If you're organizing your, your content by format, that's unintentionally impersonal. A second way to be unintentionally impersonal is to make people have to search or filter your content to find what they need. I've been in digital media a long time. My first job at an internet company was in 1994, and I don't admit that to everybody. I still remember seeing the first implementation of a filtered search on a web page, and boy, was that cool in the 90s. But it's 2020. Does anybody want to spend more time doing filtered searches? There's a reason you don't see a search screen when you turn on Netflix. It's because they know it's better to make suggestions for you based upon what they already know about you. Personalization today is not giving people search tools. It's getting to know people well enough so you can automatically surface what's relevant to them without making them do any work. Third, you can be unintentionally impersonal when you treat everybody as if they're exactly the same. People aren't cloned sheep, obviously, but rather individuals with their own unique needs and experiences and relationship to you. One might know you well, where another doesn't. One person searching for something specific, another's just, another just casually exploring for a decision that they're gonna make down the road. Yet, most organizations don't do a very good job of accounting for individual differences. Even Amazon Prime Video, as incredibly sophisticated as they are, they only started asking me this month when I load up the Prime Video app on my TV, whether it was me or another member of my household watching. So there's room for improvement in personalization, even in the largest and most data rich organizations. The fourth way to be unintentionally impersonal, not asking questions. I'd like you to think for a moment of the person with whom you've had the most serious relationship of your life. How did you get to know them after you first met? Did you immediately start droning on and on for 15 or 20 minutes about yourself and your best qualities? Or rather, did you ask questions to get to know them and tailor your side of the conversation according to their answers? Of course you asked questions. In doing so, you indicated interest, concern, and a desire for a personal connection. That's what questions do. They're so powerful, but questions are still not regularly asked by organizations, apart from annual surveys and the occasional customer experience email, such as, how was your flight? Asking questions is such an obvious requirement of interpersonal relationships, so it's shocking 
how little it's done by organizations. Last but not least, you're unintentionally impersonal if your communications feel canned. For most organizations sending emails, mail merge is about as personalized as it gets. Wow, you can substitute the person's name at the top of a form letter. That's amazing, right? No, it's not amazing. It's standard. And in disclosure, CredSpark uses mail merge just like everybody else. But just because it's standard doesn't mean it's good enough. It doesn't mean your communications are sufficiently personal. If you've gotten the same form letter as 5,000 other people, does that make you feel special? Because you are a creator of content, you should think about what the experience of that content feels like to the individual, and it should be your goal to make them feel special. All right, so enough bad news. I've just spent several minutes uh, sharing that most of us are unintentionally impersonal and we need to do a better job. So if you're still hanging with me after I've been such a bummer, here's your reward because I've got some good news. Digital personalization is affordable. If you've ever treated yourself to an article of custom clothing, you've noticed that they usually don't come very cheap. But personalization of your digital properties, delivering each person a custom tailored experience does not have to break the bank. It takes work and a modest investment, and it's often achieved using a branch of artificial intelligence that I call the overlooked middle child of the AI family. It's called natural language generation. Natural language generation, or NLG, is far older and less hyped than its other AI siblings, natural language understanding or natural language processing, both of which are more sophisticated, frankly. Um, and then, of course, there's machine learning, which is another level entirely of sophistication and cost. But I'm a fan of NLG because it's comparatively simple, affordable, and still extremely useful for personalizing digital experiences. So how does NLG work? In a nutshell, you feed data into an NLG algorithm, and then it rapidly applies human-designed sets of rules around language, which words should appear where, how the wording should vary, et cetera. And then it outputs a story based upon that data and those rules. I use the word story, but you could just as easily substitute description or explanation or recommendation. I tend to think of stories because storytelling is the oldest and most powerful form of communication. So it's only fitting that storytelling has gotten a lot more attention lately in digital marketing. NLG is being rapidly adopted in the world of business intelligence, data-driven journalism, et cetera. But here's where NLG gets really interesting. You can feed an NLG algorithm data you've captured from asking your audience questions. And you can use the individual answers to highly personalize the content that gets surfaced to them and the story that is told to them. This is where the engagement magic happens. You can make each audience member a hero in a story about themselves. Here's the user experience. It's very simple. A person answers some question on your website via their computer, their mobile device. Then some behind the scenes magic happens to generate instantly a personalized narrative, which is delivered to that individual. Again, as experienced by the user, it's simple and painless. It has the really interesting quality of feeling both completely natural and a little bit magical. Everything they've just told you, you can reflect back to them, which is completely normal in face-to-face -face communication, but it feels amazing in a digital experience. This is what we at CredSpark mean by personalize. This allows you to naturally generate strong engagement and relevance to your audience. Unlike 99% of your communications out there, it's not going to wash over people because this story is about them. So if you have a visitor to your digital property, they're interested in you. And if they're interested, it's your chance to start a conversation. This is the ultimate promise of personalization. You can have one-to-one -one conversations at infinite scale. This makes individuals feel special. You can personalize content to their specific needs. 
It gets their attention. It makes them feel known and understood. And it's what people expect more and more. It's what makes an impact and cuts through all the noise in our digital lives. So if you buy into this idea of personalization, let's now explore a few use cases for you um, based upon solutions that we at CrudSpark have developed for and with our clients. For today's virtual event, I opted to avoid any potential technical glitches. So I won't be doing live demos of these solutions, unfortunately, and I apologize. But if you're interested in kicking the tires on any of these, you can either email info at credspark.com or visit www.credspark.com to see for yourself how these solutions work. So before we go into this, I want to talk a little bit about behavioral data versus declared data. Somebody came up with a really nice distinction between these two types of data. Behavioral data is akin to data exhaust. It's the data that's a byproduct of a person doing something, clicks, downloads, etc. Basically, it's the data you collect without the individual having to do anything in particular, without you having to ask someone anything. Declared data, however, is what you get when you ask someone a direct question. So better declared data is going to unlock for you a few things. It's going to make your editorial content better informed. It's going to allow better marketing and message targeting for you. It's going to improve your market research and your market segmentation. And it's going to generate a lot of new product ideas for you. So let's dive in to the personalization in particular, and I want to start get into these examples. So the first is around content recommendations. So you can turn your content into highly personalized experiences for people recommending articles, videos, webinars, et cetera, for them. What's typical today is for content creators to just put out a bunch of content to their audience, give them a list of what's available and let people filter and search that content by subject matter, topic, date, et cetera. And then if one of those pieces of content feels relevant, then the person can read it, download it, et cetera. Over the past few years, there's been a greater level of sophistication around looking at behavioral data on a website, seeing where a person's clicking, and then using that to sort of shuffle the content that is presented to someone and service it in slightly different ways, depending upon the behavioral data. That's a big improvement. But these types of solutions are still not personalized for two reasons. First, they're not asking a person direct questions about what interests them, and then using that declared data to recommend specific content resources. And second, these technologies are still largely serving up lists instead of narratives in which you explain and you contextualize the resources, making it clear why these particular resources are for that individual. So specifically, at CredSpark, we helped a client called the American College of Chess Physicians, known as CHEST. They're a professional association, mainly of doctors who focus on respiratory health, which is obviously a very important topic these days. CHEST over the years has built a huge library of learning resources for physicians, but they turned to CredSpark to help develop a way for non-physicians, such as nurses and respiratory therapists, to really discover the most relevant content to them and to personalize CHEST's library for an individual who's not a doctor. So thanks to the solution, wherein somebody answers a few questions and then immediately gets a tailored curated list of resources based on their needs. Um, this allows CHEST to reflect to someone who's not a doctor how they can most effectively learn and critically care for patients, which can literally save lives. In addition, it makes CHEST relevant to an entirely new audience segment, building their brand equity, their membership, et cetera. I want to take another use case, which is around product recommendations. So um, you can create custom solutions and packages for potential customers using NLG and using personalization. Historically, the role of packaging a solution or products and services to an individual has been the role of the sales representative. 
First, that sales rep speaks to a prospect, asks them a series of questions, and then based upon the prospect's answers, comes up with a recommended set of products, options, features, et cetera. Um, this is another area where personalization can dramatically improve the experience. In survey after survey, potential buyers report that they wanna do their own upfront research. They wanna gather a lot of information from your website before the first conversation with a sales rep. So how much more compelling would that pre-purchase research be if the prospect had the ability to answer a few questions on your website about their needs and then receive a readable individualized solution, which explains in detail the benefits of choosing your product or service and contextualized within that person's organization, their role, their needs, et cetera. Analogy, again, makes this much more affordable and achievable. So one of our clients, a leading B2B US media brand in the grocery sector is called Progressive Grocer. They mainly sell advertising. They needed a way to make their sales process be much more efficient. Rather than having a sales rep call up the potential advertiser and have a lengthy initial conversation uncovering the prospect's needs, CredSpark built them a solution called the Proposalizer. That's the code name, not the official name. Now, when a prospect visits Progressive Grocer's website, they're asked seven questions, as you can see here. And then when the person submits those answers, logic is applied which instantly sorts through hundreds of possible projects, or products rather, and generates a custom HTML page with a proposal for that person based upon the four to five most highly relevant products that are going to meet their needs. So this works not only technically, this entire solution paid for itself within two weeks of launch in terms of new clients understanding the value and the benefit of Progressive Grocer's offerings and signing up and becoming customers. The third use case I want to bring up is in event marketing. So events, DrupalCon or any other event, typically can have so much content that it can feel overwhelming because there's so many options on the stage, breakout sessions, birds of a feather, roundtables, etc. Think how many options you have at this conference alone. So not all of us attend events for the same reasons. When each of us as an individual is thinking about investing our time or money in attending an event, it really helps to know that this event is gonna be relevant to our needs and that these particular sessions are going to be most relevant to our time. So CredSpark has built several such event personalization solutions for a large client called Read Exhibitions. And there's one in particular that we launched in 2019 that I like to tell you about. Um, it's called Global Gaming Expo. It's one of Reed's larger events that they manage. You can check it out on CredSpark's Vimeo channel for a video about how the solution worked and the impact that it made. But I'll summarize it in these three stats that you see here. So of the people who completed this personalization experience, 34% of those registered to attend the event. Of the ones who registered, 80% of those people were new. They were first time attendees. And so ultimately the return on investment to read was over 400%. More attendees meant happier sponsors, overall greater event value. So let's start to get relevant to you, okay? To make it really real, I'd like you to think about personalization in your organization. Are there opportunities to personalize learning pathways for people that learn from you? Solution guides or proposals, your events, your product catalogs or research products. The key thing here is that a lot of these are probably things that you are doing already. What I'm not here to, to, to suggest today is that you undertake a whole new set of activities, but rather that you add personalization on as a layer on top of what you're already doing. And if you do it, you're gonna be doing these things just more effectively, creating more value for your audience and for your own organization. At the end of the day, personalization is about meaning more to individuals. That's the definition of a good relationship, right? Meaning more to another person. 
to be blunt, it's not just about meaning more, but it's about you and your organization not getting left behind. Personalized digital experiences, it's a macro trend and it's not going away. It's where the world is headed. You either need to start working on getting better declared data and using that to drive personalization, or you risk losing relevance and therefore losing audience engagement and potentially growth. But with a strategic approach to data and personalization, you're gonna win. My colleagues and I at CredSpark would like to get to know you to see if we can be more helpful to your declared data strategy, your personalization initiatives, and help you mean more to your audience. We have a personalization example on our own website. We call it the Thought Starter. You can find it at www.credspark.com. You can answer some questions and then get some ideas and resources tailored to your needs and your goals. Um, our interactive content tools can embed in any HTML page and they work with Drupal or any web stack. And with that, um, I wanna thank you very much for listening, for your time. And I'd love to open it up to any questions which may have uh, showed up in the chat window while I was uh, speaking. So please love to hear from you. Okay, um, let's go with a couple questions. The first one is about uh, slides. And um, I believe there will be a slide link appearing uh, after this session. My, uh, my friends at the Drupal Association can confirm. Um, it's good to see that someone is uh, doing an example of, uh, of personalization already on their, on their website. Um, and uh, that's awesome. Anyone who's thinking this way and getting conversational with their, uh, with their uh, audience is, uh, is ahead of the game. So uh, shout out to uh, Fabletics. Um, a question from John is, are there any tips or tricks to get people to answer questions without needing them to create an account or having it feel weird? Yes, John. Um, what we find is a great way to get people to answer questions about themselves is to ask them initially some questions about the world or their industry. So a lot of our clients will start with questions about industry trends or regulations or you know sort of how well do you know a change that's happening or something like that in your in your world and in your in your industry and once you get someone thinking about such questions and answering such questions then that's your opportunity to really ask them some questions about themselves and their own organization and their needs we think of it as sort of engaging someone's brain sort of reaching past the eyeballs into the brain get them thinking about the world and then they're kind of opened up to start answering questions about about themselves um, so uh, Michael mentions that uh, targets are scientists and researchers um, who are wary of tracking and techniques. Uh, it's a great, great point, Michael. Some of our clients' audiences, such as attorneys, uh, other folks are very, very wary about sharing their personal information. Um, I would submit that, again, if you start by engaging people's brains and sort of understanding uh, you know, input of their of their particular organizations. Um, you're going to, um, uh, you know, that's your entree into getting to know them and saying, hey, can we set up a little quid pro quo here? So if you share a little bit of information about you, we have some additional value you can, we can create for you. Again, the quid pro quo is natural in conversation. It's a little uh, less uh, uh, common in the world of digital audiences, but uh, it can be done. Um, Sarah says, would I recommend using a web chat to start the conversation? You know, I, I don't necessarily know that I would share, uh, would Sarah, because, um, you know, asking someone to, to uh, attend a web chat is a little bit more of an ask than sort of starting out with maybe a simple question or two, right? You're asking more of their time whenever you're, th you're saying, hey, let's start the conversation with, with a web chat. It's just a bit more involved. You might start with a couple of questions to sort of prime the pump in that relationship um, and get going that way. Uh, Sam asks about GDPR compliance, um, and that's a great question. Uh, again, a lot of our clients are, are media companies are thinking a lot about GDPR. Um, and what we find is that if our clients are upfront about their role as a data controller, uh, others as a data processor under the you know, GPR guidelines. Um, if you're upfront with individuals about what's that quid pro quo, when they share information with you, how's it gonna be used? Um, 
if you sort of clearly articulate that you're seeking this information in order to create value for them in some fashion, that really uh, can help uh, win the day and should keep you out of any uh, GDPR compliance issues. Um, Matthew's asking about how does website personalization impact remarketing? Great question in the world, a rapidly changing world of you know third party cookies and everything like that. Um, it's a complex topic. Uh, I will be the first to submit that I'm not a super expert in this one, but you know, if you want to reach out, we could pull in some folks from Critspark and, and, and discuss that with you in more detail, Matthew. I'd be happy to, to do that. Um, Dan mentions that this is a sort of a, pri a sort of a positive approach to privacy and personalization. Um, yes, users should have the choice to answer questions. Um, when it comes to the type of data we're collecting or we're helping our clients collect, um, some of it is personal data, it is PII. And uh, the way we handle it for our clients is we sit always within the limits of our clients uh, you know, privacy policies and data use policies, security, et cetera. So we never use that information for ourselves. It belongs to the client. The content and data completely belong to the client uh, as it should be, right? Again, I think the whole key behind a lot of this privacy uh, regulation, which is very necessary, is transparency and choice, being transparent with people, the choice and the power about how that information uh, ought to be used. Um, Tim asks, uh, can I get into the weeds a little bit about uh, how these personalization systems work? Uh, does it require tagging all your content? So uh, great question, Tim, and I, I love getting into the weeds. I'll just go a little bit in the weeds and then we can maybe uh, love to strike a conversation afterwards. Um, one of the nice things about some of these NLG solutions that I'm proposing is that they're actually not machine learning, okay? So we talked to some clients about this and they say, well, this isn't as sophisticated as, as machine learning. You're not using huge data sets to sort of do real time adjustments to content relevance and blah, blah, blah. And I say, yes, that's true. You can't really do that and yet carry on a one-to-one -one conversation with someone. You need the real back and forth. So what our clients tend to do is think about upfront what do they want to learn from an individual? And then what types of information do they want to service to that person and in, in ways that make it clearly relevant to that individual? It doesn't, I mean, it requires you, you know, having content and some sort of a taxonomy and you know, some sort of a structure to your content that you want to service up front. The, most of the work we do is sort of logic based and, and deterministic uh, because that makes for a highly you know, successful uh, sort of relevant you know, conversation starter with someone. Um, but there are varying degrees depending upon how, you, how much data about your topic tags and, and context flows into that personalization. So I don't want to get too deep in, in the weeds on that one, Tim, but happy to talk offline. Um, and um, Let's see. So Anne asks, uh, do you run the risk of hiding content with, that would expand their interest? That's a great question, Anna. Anna. Um, I would say that you do potentially run the risk of not uh, servicing the right thing. Um, the way you can mitigate that risk is by uh, making certain that the you know the sort of the the set of content that you have available is pretty robust. Um, that it covers a range of different reasons why someone might be interacting with you and wanting to learn more about you and you know consume more of your content. Um, and uh, I would argue that you're less likely to lose somebody because you missed maybe one or two pieces of content that were highly relevant to them than you are because you hit them with so much content that they sort of didn't know where to start in that big, big ocean of, of stuff that they that they might uh, um, you know, partake in. Um, so, uh, so John says, uh, do you have personalization tools you recommend? Um, we uh, have used some NLG algorithms. Um, you, can, you can rent some of these uh, solutions. If you Google them online, you can find some of those things. Um, we use those uh, in combination with our own uh, software tools. So CredSpark is in the business of sort of creating these personalized experiences for our clients. And again, happy to, to discuss uh, on this, uh, you know, sort of offline if, if that's of interest. Um, so uh, Kara or Melissa, if there are uh, no additional questions, anybody have anything else that they wanna get in with a couple remaining minutes? 
Maybe not. Um, well, again, thank you to DrupalCon. Thank you everyone who took the time to show up today. I hope this will be the, the beginning of a, uh, of a conversation that uh, we can have uh, as individuals. And um, thanks again, it's been a real pleasure.